So what I wanted to uh, do now is bring down the level of uh, the very, very technical information that was just presented uh, with the two speakers before, down to something that we all sort of do, um, which is publishing. And I wanted to show you uh, some of the things that we've, we're doing around uh, publishing that uh, hopefully will affect some of you in the future. So, we have, uh, I think, been told by various uh, organizations, including here, Nature, in this special uh, section, that we are not doing a fantastic job at reproducing uh, the results that we publish. Uh, some of those uh, reproductions have been uh, things like uh, the Macintosh operating system, uh, which actually affects cortical thickness. Uh, this is a real... <laughs> This is uh, one of those sorts of uh, uh, things that we would like to avoid, potentially, but uh, you know, it, it does actually happen. So, um, and has been reported very nicely, uh, there are a lot of antibody uh, uh, misses in terms of the ability to reproduce results, and there are other things. All of these affect science in a pretty significant way. Now, um, what I would like to show you is here is a fairly typical paper. Uh, there are some antibodies that are actually pulled out in that little teeny tiny uh, bit of the methods, which is kind of made a lot bigger here uh, in the major, uh, in the, the main section. And uh, here's an antibody against actin. Um, now what I might be asking as a researcher is, what are, um, you know, what are the studies that are using my particular monoclonal mouse antibody? There it is, I found it in that particular paper. I go to Sigma and uh, lo and behold, I have multiple antibodies which I now have to purchase all of and try to recreate the study, right? This is bad. But surely, this cannot be the state of the art. Well, our colleagues at OHSU um, had taken this on as a question, and uh, the hypothesis was that in fact that was the norm, and in fact they looked across five different domains of biological science, they looked across different uh, impact factors of journals, they pulled out lots of antibodies, lots of journals, lots of papers, and lo and behold, we are not doing all that well. Now what this is showing here uh, is, if you look across just this graph right here, these are the individual uh, um, reproducibilities or, or identifiabilities of these reagents. So these are reagents. Uh, here are the antibodies, cell lines, constructs, knockdown reagents, and organisms. And this fraction here is out of the total number of papers and out of the total number of antibodies, for example, that were found in papers by a curator, less than 50% were actually able to be identified back at the manufacturer's website. So this is not great. These are fairly recent papers. Ooh, I'm losing the microphone. Okay. So, um, Technical difficulties. All right, here we go. All right, um, so what we've done is we've actually created a pilot project that um, uh, answered a very important question for me, which uh, INCF was uh, very kind enough to, to answer, which is the way to an editor's heart is actually through their stomach. So what we did is we asked the editor-in-chiefs of um, multiple journals in the neuroscience domain to come in for a nice meal and try to discuss this topic, right? So out of this and another uh, couple of follow-ups um, at both the Society for Neuroscience and uh, at the NIH, we actually got together a group of these journal editors that were willing to tackle this problem and the, the thing that they agreed on is they agreed the kinds of entities, the kinds of infrastructure, and the kinds of procedures that would be used for this pilot project. Uh, we established the working group. Here are all of the members. Uh, actually, this is just a few of the members of the total working group. There's many, many more. Um, some of them are in this room. Thank you all very much. <laughs> um, so the pilot project involves looking at software and databases. 
It involves looking at antibodies and model organisms, especially the transgenic animals. And what we would like all of the authors to do that are participating in the pilot is to include the unique identifiers inside of their methods section. And this is what the editors are supposed to be asking their, uh, the, uh, um, these people. And uh, what we were able to do is this is going to be voluntary, or this has been voluntary for authors. Um, the journals, we decided, should not have to modify their systems in order to participate. And we are leaving this open entirely to the journals in terms of when they would like to ask and how. Okay. One of the technology pieces that had to be built for this, because we didn't want authors to go to 10 different uh, websites uh, from 10 different uh, model organism communities and all of these other uh, places, we built one portal. Um, this is built on our new SciCrunch uh, infrastructure. And what we were able to do is put all of the data from the model organism databases, the antibody registry, and the NIF registry together in one uh, place uh, where the authors would basically go in here to the portal. They would find their particular resource. There's a Cite This button, which opens up this little dialog box, which they can then copy and paste into their methods section. So, this is uniform. It's implemented across most of the major publishers, uh, everyone who is uh, participating. And so, what we found now that we have um, actually uh, concluded about the fifth month of this uh, pilot project is we have just had 100 articles appear in Google Scholar. Um, so you can search for these right now on your laptops. Uh, this is if you just go to Google Scholar, basically, and you put in RRID, and you have to sort of sort by English and by date. That usually works a little better. Um, you want to search for everything, not just abstracts. And what we find is that we can actually pull back all the papers that used a particular resource or a particular antibody. In this case, this is a uh, Chemicon uh, antibody that is used in these four different papers. And this is all being identified by this AB90755 antibody ID. You can see that these people I, um, took that antibody from Chemicon. Um, which, by the way, this is just published within the last two months. This company has been out of business for over 10 years. Um, the, uh, this, this paper published the same antibody from Millipor. It just so happens that Millipore took over Chemicon uh, about 10 years ago. Um, now, this uh, person is publishing Millipore Chemicon antibody, and this one is in uh, a place where actually Millipore is not. So, um, but the, the, the analysis here shows that, you know, in all cases, this ID is the same and it is being uniformly applied, whereas the, the other uh, portions of this are really a lot more free texty. So, what we have uh, is this 100 papers out of 15 different journals. Uh, we've identified 630 RRIDs that have been used by, uh, by uh, uh, authors. Uh, amazingly, three were removed by typesetting. 95% um, of the authors' uh, assessments of what their IDs were were actually correct. So we feel that this is very, very nice. This is a good uh, amount of correctness. Uh, there, has a, there is a false negative rate. It's roughly 14%. This, this number is not as uh, safe as the other numbers. Um, but to the antibody registry, for example, which holds 2.2 million antibodies with IDs, uh, about 200 were added during this pilot phase. Um, in terms of software tools, about 75 excuse me, about 75 were added. So it's really driving registration to these uh, registries and these resources. There have also been several mice registered. There have been, uh, there's been at least one rat that went over to uh, the RGD. Um, all of this, this data is available freely right now, pre-publication, at the Force 11 website. Um, and this I just got from uh, Dr. Vasileski on Friday, so I thought I'd share it with you today. 
Um, so Dr. Vasileski was the, uh, our, our colleague at OHSU, and what she was able to do is she was able to now go back, apply her same standards for identifiability um, for, are we done? Okay. Anyway, it looks like we're doing better with the, the uh, journals that are um, actually participating in the pilot in terms of how much identifiably, uh, identifiability we're able to get for all three of these types of tools. So, um, oh, uh, really quick, uh, Elsevier has actually just added our resolver service to, um, to Science Direct. That should be coming out uh, in the next week. So um, these RRIDs are able to be put into papers. They uh, are able to be found. Authors are not complaining too much. <laughs> and um, it seems like this is a really good way to go. Um, if you like this project, and I'm sorry I'm going over, uh, please help. <laughs> Um, I, I assume that all of you are authors. Perhaps you can add one of these identifiers. Um, and if you are an editor or a reviewer, uh, excuse me, if you're an editor, please come talk to me because there is still time to participate. All right, thank you very much. Running them. Um, who's responsible for making the RRID? Um, so the the people. So the people make the people making the RRIDs are uh, essentially whatever community uh, is actually in charge of producing those identifiers. So for mice, it's MGI. For rats, it's RGD. For the antibody registry, the antibody registry does that. Okay. Um, and that's us. Okay. <laughs> and what, what's what, yeah. Go ahead. What, what, what was the reason for using RIDs instead of uh, digital object identifiers, for instance? Or? Um, our, well, uh, the um, databases already create uh, these identifiers. I mean, pulling an identifier for, as a DOI for a mouse doesn't make much sense because it's not a digital object. Mice are ten typically fuzzy objects, so thank you. <laughs>